Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our loving Heavenly Father, as we begin this series on the Hebrew sanctuary that you gave as a model of the plan of salvation, we ask, Father, that you will enlighten our minds and that you will soften our hearts so that we might understand the great truths that we find in the sanctuary and not only understand them in our minds, but also apply the lessons in our hearts. We ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit, for human minds cannot understand the great things of God unaided. So we plead for your presence. And we thank you, Father, for the privilege of approaching your throne boldly, because we do it in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Psalms. And we're going to Psalm 73, and I would like to read verses 3, and then verses 12 through 14, and then we will jump down to verse 17. This psalm was written by Asaph. You know, many of the psalms were written by David, but this particular psalm was written by an individual called Asaph. And basically, uh, what Asaph is struggling with is the prosperity of the boastful and of the wicked. And I want you to notice uh, how he expresses this envy at the beginning and then how he answers his question about why the wicked prosper. Let's begin by reading Psalm 73 and verse 3. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And then we jump down to verse 12. Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. And then he says, Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain, washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. In other words, what use is it to cleanse your life, to be righteous, because the wicked prosper and the righteous are chastened? But now I want you to notice the answer that he found to his uh, problem. It's found in verse 17. It says there, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. There was something in the sanctuary, in the Hebrew sanctuary, that explained that it is good to cleanse your heart from sin and that the wicked who prosper, prosper the, the boastful who are successful in life will eventually receive a just reward for their deeds. The Hebrew sanctuary has the explanations that many times leave questions in the mind. Now I'd like to begin by mentioning the sanctuaries that are brought to view in Scripture, particularly the earthly sanctuaries. Now the first sanctuary that was built, of course, was the sanctuary in the wilderness in the times of Moses. This sanctuary was built around the year 1445 B.C. And I'd like to read Exodus 25 and verse 8, and then we'll go down to verse 40, where this particular tabernacle or this sanctuary is spoken of. Exodus 25 and verse 8, here God is speaking, and he says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And then in verse 40, God told Moses to make this sanctuary according to the pattern that he showed him in the mountain. It says there, And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you in the mount. And then in Exodus 36 through 39, we find the building of this sanctuary that God told Moses to build. 
Now, after the sanctuary had been built, all of its different parts, we find in Exodus chapter 40 and verse 34 that the Shekinah glory of God entered the Hebrew sanctuary. Let's read that verse, Exodus 40 and verse 34. The sanctuary has been built, all of its parts are complete, and now we find these words. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So this is the first sanctuary that is mentioned in Holy Scripture that was built on earth, the Hebrew sanctuary at the times of Moses. But then God had Israel make a more permanent structure because the sanctuary in the wilderness was actually a tent that they could move around. But when Israel entered the promised land, God told David and then Solomon to build a more permanent structure, which came to be known as Solomon's temple. And now that's a misnomer because it wasn't Solomon's temple. Solomon built it, but it was really the Lord's temple. This temple was built around the year 960 B.C. And to give you a little bit of background, if you read in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter uh, 6, you'll find that Solomon offered a prayer after the building of this temple. And then in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, once again the Shekinah glory of God entered the sanctuary or the temple that Solomon had built. Let's read from 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verses 1 and 2. It says, When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And so once again, we find the building of a sanctuary. This is a permanent temple in the year 960 B.C., built by Solomon. The building is actually described in 2 Chronicles chapters 3 and 4 and 5. And then in chapter 6, we have Solomon's prayer and in chapter 7, we have the Shekinah glory entering the temple that Solomon built. But because of the apostasy of Israel, this temple was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar in the year 586. And of course, Israel was taken captive for a period of 70 years to Babylon. And uh, there was a promise that after they were in Babylon for 70 years, they would be able to go back to their land, reestablish their religion, and build the temple once again. So after the captivity, in the year 536, they went back to their land, and they built the temple, and the temple was finished in the year 515 B.C. This temple is spoken of in Haggai chapter 2 and verses 6 through 9. Now, there's something very interesting about this temple that was built after the captivity, and that is that this temple had no Shekinah glory go into it. In fact, when this temple was finished, many of those who had seen Solomon's temple actually cried when they saw how inferior this temple was to the, Sol to the temple that Solomon had built. Let's read about this temple in Haggai chapter 2 and verses 6 through 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations. And then, and notice, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And then comes this promise. The glory of this latter temple, that is the, cap the temple that was built after the captivity, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, that is, than Solomon's temple, says the Lord of hosts. And I will give in this place, peace, 
says the Lord of hosts. Do you know the Jews are still trying to explain how this prophecy was fulfilled? Because the temple that was built after the captivity, at least outwardly, never reached the magnitude of glory that the temple built by Solomon had reached. What was meant here when God gave the promise that this post-exilic temple would be filled with glory and that the glory of this latter temple would be greater than the former temple? The fact is that this was fulfilled because Jesus Christ himself walked in the courts of this temple. Now, his glory, according to Scripture, was veiled. But he brought peace to this place because he was the Prince of Peace. Now, this temple was actually beautified and remodeled and enlarged by Herod the Great. We find a description of this in John chapter 2 and verse 20. Actually, it took 46 years for Herod the Great to uh, remodel and to enlarge and to beautify this post-exilic temple. It says there in John chapter 2 and verse 20, Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? Of course, Jesus had said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I would raise it up. And they thought that he was talking about the temple that Herod had remodeled that had taken 46 years to remodel and to beautify. So we find these temples in Scripture. We find the sanctuary in the wilderness. We find the temple built by Solomon. We find the temple which was built after the exile in the year 515. And then the temple that was beautified and enlarged by Herod the Great. Now the question is, what did these sanctuaries represent? What did these sanctuaries symbolize? Did God just build these sanctuaries because he wanted to dwell among Israel? Or was there a particular reason why God told Israel to build these sanctuaries? The fact is that these earthly sanctuaries were symbolic or represented several things. I want you to notice the first thing that these sanctuaries represented or symbolized. The earthly sanctuary actually was a symbol of the heavenly sanctuary. It was a scale model of the heavenly sanctuary. God wanted Israel to understand by looking at the earthly sanctuary things about the heavenly sanctuary. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 1 through 5 where we find very clearly that the earthly sanctuary was a symbol or was an illustration of the much greater heavenly sanctuary. It says there in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the what? of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. For every pre high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore it is necessary that this one, that is Christ, also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. And now notice what it says about the earthly sanctuary who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. What was the earthly sanctuary? It was a what? It was a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, see that you make all things according to the what? According to the pattern shown to you on the mount. So the earthly sanctuary was only a small-scale illustration of the heavenly sanctuary to give an idea of what God's heavenly sanctuary is like. Also, Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12, tells us about this comparison between the earthly sanctuary and the heavenly sanctuary. It says there in Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12, and I'm reading from the King James Version, which is more accurate, it says, but Christ, 
being come a high priest of good things to come, now notice, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. Notice once again that the true tabernacle, the heavenly sanctuary, is a more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. In other words, the earthly sanctuary had the purpose of serving as a scale model to illustrate great truths about the greater heavenly sanctuary. So one reason why God had all of these earthly sanctuaries built was because he wanted people to catch a vision of the heavenly sanctuary. But these earthly temples represented other things as well, and we're going to study this in this seminar. These temples also represented our body temple. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. You see, the sanctuary is an illustration of us, of our body temple. In fact, we have a whole lecture that is titled The Two Temples towards the end of this series where I'm going to compare the sanctuary with our body temple. God gave these temples to illustrate plans that he had for our own personal body temple. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. See, the Shekinah is the Holy Spirit in the case of our body temple. Whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So in other words, Another reason why God had these sanctuaries built is because he wanted to give great lessons about our own personal body temple. Incidentally, these temples were also built to give great lessons about the body temple of Jesus. Notice what we find in John chapter 2 and verses 19 through 21. John chapter 2 and verses 19 through 21. See, these earthly sanctuaries also illustrated great truths about Jesus and his body temple. It says there in John chapter 2 and verse 19, Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? Now notice verse 21, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So the temple was actually symbolic of the body temple of Jesus, interestingly enough. So the temple was given not only to give lessons about the heavenly sanctuary, about our body temple, but also about the body temple of Jesus Christ. But there's another dimension to these earthly temples. These earthly temples were also given as an illustration of the Christian church, which in Scripture is called the temple of God. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 19 through 22. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 19 through 22. Here we find that these earthly temples or sanctuaries represented the Christian church. It says there in verse 19, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now notice this spiritual temple having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. These, these are not stone foundations. The foundations of this temple are the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. See, the temple had a chief cornerstone that held it all together. And now notice, we are the building. It says in verse 21, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a what? grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together. Is there a Shekinah in this church temple? Absolutely. It says, in whom also 
you are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So these earthly temples were given to teach great lessons about the heavenly sanctuary, about Jesus Christ, about our body temple, and about the Christian church. In fact, later on, we're going to have a lecture where we talk about the Antichrist sitting in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. Some people think that somebody's going to rise over in the Middle East and sit in a literally rebuilt Jewish temple. Is it just possible that he's going to sit within the Christian church itself? And that's the temple that Scripture is talking about? I believe so. Now let's talk a little bit about the geography of the sanctuary or of the temple. And uh, you'll find an illustration here on the platform. Uh, the only uh, one that is in, not in order is the central one where you have the priest and you have the lamb. I put that one there because that's central to the sanctuary service. Without that, you don't have anything. All of the other panels are in the exact order in which the sanctuary was built. Now we're supposed to read from east to west because the sanctuary was actually, the entrance to the sanctuary was actually on the east side, which means that when people worshiped towards the sanctuary, their backs were to the sun. That was intentional because in antiquity, People worship with their faces towards the sun, according to Ezekiel chapter 8. But because the entrance to the sanctuary was on the east side, when people faced east, their backs were what? Their backs were to the sun. They were not to worship the sun god. And so you have, first of all, the camp. And that's not depicted here on the platform. You have the camp. That's where Israel lived. That's where sinners lived. They were the ones who needed the sanctuary. The sanctuary encampment was actually part of the Hebrew sanctuary. We usually start with the court, holy place, and most holy place, but the camp we're going to find was very, very important in the sanctuary service. And so the camp is the first key place of the Hebrew sanctuary. There were three tribes that camped at each point of the compass of the sanctuary. And then, of course, we have the court which is kind of like a yard without a roof on it. And the court had two key pieces of furniture. As you went in through the gate into the court, you had the altar of sacrifice. That's where all of the animals that were sacrificed were placed and they were burned. And then a little bit further in, before you got to the entrance of the sanctuary, you had the laver. And so I want you to keep this in your mind because uh, every aspect of the sanctuary is extremely important. So you have the camp beyond all of this where Israel was camped, where the needy sinners were living, and then you have the altar of sacrifice, and then you have the labor. Both of those pieces of furniture were actually in the court of the sanctuary. And then you go into the tent proper. And as you go into the tent you go into an apartment which is called the holy place of the sanctuary. And by the way, you're going from west to east. So as you're going in through the door, into the tent, you look to the left, that's south, and you see a seven-branched candlestick. And you have the illustration in your hands. You have a seven-branched candlestick that remained lighted all the time. It had oil all of the time. And then as you look to the right, which is north, you have the table of the showbread, 12 loaves of bread in two stacks on this golden table, the table of the showbread. And then straight in front of you, uh, as you go uh, towards the most holy place, right before you go beyond the veil, you have the altar, the golden altar of incense. So in other words, in the holy place of the sanctuary, you have three pieces of furniture. You have in the south, the seven branch candlestick, pure gold, 120 pounds. We're going to study that, a pure gold. And then you have the table of the showbread, which is north. As you look to your right, 12 loaves of bread. That is a very important number we're going to find. And then straight ahead of you, before you go into the most holy place, you have the golden altar of incense, where incense was burning all the time. And then you have a veil, and behind the veil, you have the apartment which is called the most holy place of the sanctuary. And in the most holy place, you have one piece of furniture, and you can see it over there. 
uh, on the far side, you have what is called the Ark of the Covenant. And above the Ark of the Covenant, you have the Shekinah glory, the glory of God that was above the Ark. And the Bible tells us that inside the Ark was, uh, the t were the two tables of stone that contained the Ten Commandments. But not only were the Ten Commandments inside the Ark of the Covenant, beneath where the glory of God was manifested above the mercy seat, which was the cover of the Ark, but you also had inside the Ark of the Covenant a pot of manna, very, very important symbolically. You had a pot of manna, the manna that fell in the wilderness for 40 years. And you also had, in the most holy place, inside the Ark of the Covenant, Aaron's rod, which was a dead rod that budded miraculously. And so in the Ark of the Covenant, you have three things. You have the tables of the law, you have a pot of manna, and you have Aaron's rod that budded. So is it clear in your mind, the geography of the sanctuary? It's very important that we have this clear in mind because we're going to be referring to it time and again as we move through this seminar. Now let's talk about the relationship between the earthly sanctuary and the heavenly sanctuary. Now, the earthly sanctuary was a small-scale model of the heavenly sanctuary. In other words, it was a miniature of the heavenly sanctuary. The heavenly sanctuary is far greater than the earthly sanctuary ever was. Let's go to uh, 1 Kings chapter 8 and verses 27 to 30. 1 Kings chapter 8 verses 27 to 30, where it speaks about the heavenly sanctuary. It says there, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built is what Solomon is saying. He continues saying, Yet regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication, O Lord my God. And listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you today, that your eyes may be open toward this temple. Notice that, that in this earthly temple, God is looking upon the earthly temple. So, it's, so it says, that your eyes may be open toward this temple night and day toward the place of which you said, my name shall be there that you may hear the prayer which your servant makes toward this place. Verse 30, And may you hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. And now listen. Hear in heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. Where was God? God was in his heavenly temple, but he also was present through his spirit where? in the earthly temple, but the earthly temple was far inferior to the heavenly temple. Notice also Acts chapter 7 and verses 47 through 50. Acts 47, chapter 7 and verses 47 to 50. Here Stephen is speaking. He's telling the story of Israel in Acts chapter 7. And he says there in verse 47, but Solomon built him a house, that is, built God a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. Where does God dwell then? God dwells in the heavenly temple. The earthly temple is simply a figure or a symbol. And then it says, uh, it continues saying, as the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool, what house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? In other words, the earthly sanctuary was only a scale model of the heavenly sanctuary. In fact, let's notice Exodus 25 and verse 40, which we already read. Let's take a look at it again. Exodus 25 and verse 40. It says, and ver I'm going to include verse 8 also, it says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And then it says in verse 40, God speaking to Moses, and see to it 
that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. So what did God show Moses on the mountain? God did not show Moses the heavenly sanctuary. God showed Moses a scale model of the heavenly sanctuary. In other words, God made a miniature of the heavenly sanctuary. In fact, let's notice Exodus 26 and verse 30, where we find the same idea. Exodus 26 and verse 30. It says, And you shall raise up the tabernacle according to its pattern which you were shown on the mountain. Now we've already read Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 1 through 5 where it says that the earthly sanctuary was a copy, the earthly sanctuary was a shadow of the true heavenly sanctuary. Allow me to explain uh, and illustrate so that we can understand the relationship between the heavenly and the earthly sanctuary. Let's take the idea of a scale model. You know, several years ago, our airport here in Fresno was, uh, was remodeled. And I don't know if uh, those of you who were here remember that there was, a, there was a, a, a little scale model of what the final airport would look like. Now, you could get an idea where everything was going to be, where the parking was going to be, where the terminal was going to be. You had an idea of where everything was going to be. But that was only a small scale model of the finished product. In other words, what God showed Moses was a little scale model of the heavenly sanctuary because the heavenly sanctuary is so large that nothing like it could have been built upon the earth. Or it's kind of like taking a picture. You know, you get a camera and you take a picture of someone. Does the picture give you an idea about that person? Yes. Is the person a lot smaller in the picture? Absolutely, yes. But does the picture give you an idea of the greater reality? Of course. And so it is with the sanctuary. The sanctuary, God took a snapshot of the sanctuary and he showed the snapshot to Moses and then Moses built the sanctuary according to the scale model that God showed him. Or we could compare it with a map. Have you ever seen a map of California? Let me ask you, what existed first, the map or California? Of course, California. And then they make a little map it shows you where all the cities are, the distances, and where all the rivers and where the mountains are. You get a pretty good bird's eye view of California, right? But it's a miniature of California. California is much greater. And so the sanctuary was in that way. God showed Moses, so to speak, a little map of the heavenly sanctuary, which is far greater. The Bible says that the earthly sanctuary was a shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. Now, in order for there to be a shadow, there has to be a reality, right, that projects the shadow. Let me ask you, what's more real, a shadow or the reality that projects the shadow? The reality. What's more real, a picture or the person who is in the picture? The person who is in the picture. Let me ask you, what is more real, a scale model or the finished product that the scale model was pointing to? The finished product. And so the heavenly sanctuary is very real. But it's huge. It's immense. The Bible tells us that millions and millions of angels are in the sanctuary. We're going to study that tomorrow morning, Lord willing. I mean, there's no earthly person that can even conceive what the heavenly sanctuary is like. So God made a little scale model, and he said to Moses, you build the sanctuary according to the scale model, which is an illustration of the greatness of the heavenly sanctuary. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12 where it says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. In other words, we can know little now, enough to get there. And when we get there, we will see the real thing. Now we need to also talk about uh, the Messiah's uh, calendar in relationship to the sanctuary. The sanctuary primarily presents the events of salvation history by Jesus Christ. But the Hebrew feasts present the calendar or the timing of those events that are illustrated in the Hebrew sanctuary. Now let's go to Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 3 
and read about these so-called Hebrew feasts. They follow the exact order of the sanctuary. Leviticus 23 and verse 3. And actually, let's start reading at verse 1 for the context. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. Now, there were four spring feasts, and there were three fall feasts. And in between the spring feasts and the fall feasts, you have a long summer drought, a long summer where there are no feasts at all. Now, allow me to mention the spring feasts. The spring feasts were the Passover. What was the Passover? What was sacrificed on the Passover? A lamb. See, there you have the altar of sacrifice represented. And then the next two feasts are unleavened bread and first fruits. Now, do you know what uh, unleavened bread represents? It represents the burial of Christ. And first fruits represents his resurrection because the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus rose the first fruits of those who went to sleep. We're going to find in our study that the labor represents the resurrection of Jesus Christ, interestingly enough. And the feast of first fruits represents the resurrection of Jesus. So we have Passover and unleavened bread, they were connected. And then we have first fruits represented also by the labor, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then you have after this, the Feast of Pentecost. On the Feast of Pentecost, we're going to find that Jesus entered the holy place. He entered there to intercede for us. In other words, he entered where the candlestick is and where the table of the showbread is and also where the uh, altar of incense is found. In other words, Pentecost, which came exactly 50 days after first fruits, represents the beginning of the intercession of Jesus in the holy place of the sanctuary. Do you see how this is following the order of events in the ministry of Christ? But it's giving us the dates because Passover, the year that Jesus died, was the 14th of Nisan. Unleavened bread was the 15th of Nisan. First fruits was the 16th of Nisan, the third day. And Pentecost was 50 days later. And the Bible tells us that on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out because Jesus had begun his intercessory ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. And then we have the fall feasts. You see, the Feast of Trumpets was the first fall feast, and it announced the coming of the Day of Atonement, which took place, it was the great day of judgment in the most holy place of the sanctuary. Let me ask you, what is the next apartment in the sanctuary in the ministration of Christ? It is the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant and where the law is. In other words, we find in the sanctuary the movements of Jesus Christ and the timing of those events. Because the Hebrew feasts give specific dates when Jesus was going to begin his ministry in these particular apartments of the sanctuary. And of course, we're going to be studying this in detail as we move along. Now, how important is the sanctuary? Let me just mention a few very important things. The book of Daniel is seeped in sanctuary terminology. In fact, there's no way you can understand the book of Daniel without the sanctuary, Particular chap particularly chapter 8, where it speaks about a little horn that takes away the daily, and where it speaks about the sanctuary being cleansed, a reference to Leviticus chapter 16, what happened on the Day of Atonement. There's no way you can understand Daniel without understanding the sanctuary. Furthermore, the whole book of Hebrews, from beginning to end, is an illustration of what Jesus has accomplished in the sanctuary. There's no way that you can understand the book of Hebrews unless you understand the Old Testament Hebrew sanctuary because the book of Hebrews is saturated with sanctuary terminology. The book of Psalms. There's no way that the book of Psalms can be understood independently of the feasts and of the sanctuary. You know, David was called, the, uh, what the Bible tells us that he was skillful in playing the harp. He was a great musician. You can read that in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 18. He was so proficient in, in playing the harp that uh, the demons even fled when he was playing for King Saul. 
uh, the Bible also tells us in 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 1 that David was called the sweet psalmist of Israel. He wrote 73 of the 150 psalms. In fact, the book of Psalms was the hymnal of the sanctuary. Each psalm had a particular sanctuary setting or the psalm was read during a particular Hebrew feast. Let me illustrate the point. You know, when Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room to institute the Lord's Supper, they sang Psalm 113 and 114. See, the psalms were the hymnal of the sanctuary. And when the service was finished, when Jesus had instituted uh, the Lord's Supper, they sang Psalm 115 through Psalm 118. Uh, do you remember that it says in the Gospels that when they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives? Well, what they sang was actually Psalm 115 through 118. Psalm 100 and, uh, 135 was sung at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Psalm 29 and Psalm 132 were sung at Pentecost and at the Feast of Tabernacles. The book of Ruth was sung at the Feast of Pentecost because it has to do with the harvest. And Psalms 47, 68, 29, and 132 were sung at the Feast of Tabernacles. In other words, the Psalms help us understand the sanctuary and the Hebrew feast because the Psalms were connected with the sanctuary service. In other words, the theme of the Psalms were connected with specific events that had to do with the Hebrew sanctuary. The book of Revelation cannot be understood without the Hebrew sanctuary. In fact, the book of Revelation is saturated with sanctuary terminology. Let's notice several examples. Notice Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. It says there, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. There were millions of lambs that were killed in the sanctuary service. It continues saying, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all of the earth. The seven candlesticks are mentioned in the book of Revelation. Notice Revelation chapter 1 and verses 12 and 13. It says there, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. See, there you have the holy place, ministry of Christ. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. The altar of incense is in the book of Revelation. Notice Revelation chapter 8 and verses 3 through, three through uh, 5. It says there, Revelation 8 verses 3 through 5, Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. So notice, you have the lamb, you have the seven candlesticks, you have the altar of incense, you also have the manna. Notice Revelation chapter uh, 2 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17. It says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. Do you know that the most holy place is also mentioned in the book of Revelation? Notice Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19. It says there, Then the temple of God was opened where? In heaven. And the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. In which temple? In the heavenly temple. Is there an ark in the heavenly temple? Most certainly. It says, then the temple of God was opened in heaven. The ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thundering, an earthquake, and great hail. In fact, uh, we don't have the time right now to show this, but the book of Revelation follows the exact order of the Hebrew sanctuary. It goes from the people in the camp to the lamb to the candlesticks to the table of showbread to the altar of incense to the most holy place. 
and then to the cessation of intercession in the most holy place. In fact, let's read that. Revelation chapter 15 and verses 5 through 8. Do you know the time is coming when the service of the sanctuary is going to come to an end? And nobody's going to be able to enter the sanctuary by faith anymore. Probation will have closed. That is presented in Revelation 15 and verses 5 through 8. Notice, after these things, I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. Now notice verse 8. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Is the sanctuary service going to come to an end someday? Amen. Most certainly it will. The most holy place ministry of Christ will come to an end. And when it comes to an end, probation will close. A time of tribulation will come, the time of the plagues. And then Jesus will return in power and glory. The book of Revelation follows the exact order of the Hebrew sanctuary from beginning to end, which means that there's no way that we can understand the book of Revelation unless we understand the sanctuary. So we must understand the sanctuary to understand the Psalms, to understand the book of Revelation, to understand the book of Hebrews, to understand other portions of Scripture. The sanctuary is of critical importance for understanding Scripture. Do you know that the sanctuary also presents step by step each event of the life of Christ, of the ministry of Christ? Let's read several verses now so that you see how the sanctuary points to each action of the ministry of Christ. John chapter 1 and verse 14 speaks about Jesus coming to the camp to live with us. John chapter 1 and verse 14. It says here, And the Word became what? Flesh. And what's, and, and what's the next word? And what? And dwelt. Do you know that word dwelt actually means he pitched his tent? The Greek word skeno, it means he came and he pitched his tent. He came to live in our midst. Before he goes into the court to die at the altar, he lives in our midst because he came to live a perfect life so that his sacrifice would be accepted. See, sometimes we forget that he had to live a holy life in order for his sacrifice to be accepted. So the first step of the ministry of Jesus is to come and live with us in the camp. And so it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Did Jesus live without sin in our midst? He most certainly did. Notice Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet what? Without sin. He lived in the camp with us, but he never what? He never sinned because he was that perfect lamb of the sanctuary service. But then the lamb had to die. That's the next step in the ministry of Jesus. He was slain and then placed on the altar. Notice 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 18 through 20. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 18 through 20 speaks about the death of the unblemished lamb. It says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, what kind of lamb? As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Was he without blemish and without spot before he shed his blood? Absolutely. He came to live in our midst, to live a life without sin, so that his sacrifice as the lamb would be acceptable. So first he came to live with us, then he came to die. Now, the interesting thing is, the next thing that Jesus does is intercede for us in the holy place. Notice what we find in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7 and verse 25. This is the next step. Jesus is now in the holy place where the table of showbread is, where the, uh, the seven-branch candlestick is, where the altar of incense is. And we're going to follow him in each lecture. We're going we're to follow him in his trek through the sanctuary. It says there in chapter 7, verse 25, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost 
those who come to God through him, since he always lives to what? To make intercession for them. See, Jesus went to heaven to the holy place to be the intercessor. Notice also 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 speaks about this stage of the ministry of Christ. It says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have what? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the what? The righteous. Let me ask you, is Jesus also going to perform someday a most holy place ministry of judgment? He most certainly is. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. It says here, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether what? Whether good or bad. And let me ask you, where was the judgment in the sanctuary. Where did the judgment take place once a year? It took place in the most holy place of the sanctuary because people will be judged by the perfect law of liberty. The judgment takes place where the law is. So Jesus is going to fulfill that function as well. But you know what's interesting? After Jesus performs his work in the most holy place of the sanctuary, the Bible tells us that he will take off his priestly garments and he will return to this earth as king. The sanctuary also tells of that stage of the ministry of Christ. Notice Revelation chapter 19, and we'll read verse 11, and then we'll jump down to verse 16. Revelation 19, verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, what is it? King of kings and Lord of lords. In other words, Jesus will come back to this earth as king of kings when he has finished his most holy place ministry. But do you know there's another ceremony that needs to take place after this? It's found in the very next chapter, chapter 20 of Revelation. Have you ever heard about the scapegoat ceremony? When a scapegoat was sent to the wilderness, to a non-inhabited land, you see that's in the next chapter, Revelation chapter 20 and verses 1 and 2. Let's read it. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil of Satan, devil and Satan, and what? And bound him for how long? For a thousand years. So the sanctuary presents the order of all of the steps that Jesus takes in the plan of salvation. Now the final point that I want to make in our lecture today is that the sanctuary actually explains all of the doctrines of the Bible. The sanctuary is the great magnet that brings all of the doctrines of the Bible together. Now let me mention some of those doctrines. Does the sanctuary present the character of God? It most certainly does. It shows that God is justice. The law demands death, but it shows that God is mercy because God takes the judgment upon himself. It shows his justice and his love. Does the sanctuary present the doctrine of sin? Millions of sacrifices died in the sanctuary service, showing that the wages of sin is what? Death. Does the sanctuary present the humanity of Jesus? It most certainly does. You know, it's interesting that the sanctuary outside was very ordinary, but inside it was beautiful. And that was a picture of Jesus. Inside his character was beautiful, but outside he had no comeliness that we should desire him. Does the Bible present the perfection of the life of Christ? Yes, because the priest could not have any blemish and the lamb could not have any blemish, which shows that Jesus had to be a perfect sacrifice and he had to be a perfect priest. Is death revealed in the sanctuary? It most certainly is. Is forgiveness revealed in the sanctuary? Absolutely. When the sinner placed his sin on the head of the animal and confessed his sin on the head of the animal, the transfer was made, and now the sinner could have the assurance of forgiveness. Is the priesthood of Jesus presented in the sanctuary? Most certainly. 
because the priest would take the blood into the holy place, the blood of the victim that, to whom the sin had been transferred, the blood was taken in, and in this way, forgiven sin was transferred into the sanctuary. Is the importance of the study of Scripture presented in the sanctuary? Yes, in the table of showbread. Is prayer presented in the sanctuary? Yes, the altar of incense. We're going to study all of these things. Is the importance of the church shedding the light of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit presented in the sanctuary? Yes, in the seven branch candlestick. Are angels presented in the sanctuary? We're going to study this tomorrow morning. Amazing. The doctrine of baptism is presented in the laver. The Trinity is presented. There's one seated on the throne. Before the throne, a lamb as though he had been slain. And also the seven branch candlesticks, which are called the seven spirits of God. The three are there. Tithing is presented in the sanctuary. This whole system was sustained by the tithes and by offerings. All of the doctrines of the Bible come together and you see the relationships of those doctrines in the perspective of the sanctuary. But not only the general truths, but also the distinctive truths. Is the judgment presented in the sanctuary? Absolutely, the cleansing of the sanctuary. Is the law presented in the sanctuary? Yes, it was in the Ark of the Covenant. Is the Sabbath found in the sanctuary? Yes, it's in the Ark of the Covenant. Is healthful living in the sanctuary? The man appointed to healthful living, we're going to study about that. God gave manna to teach Israel to have a simple diet. Is the state of the dead presented in the sanctuary? Yes, that rod that sprouted life by a miracle of God, we're going to find represented that life comes only through Jesus Christ. The Antichrist is presented in the sanctuary as well. He sits in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. The millennium is in the sanctuary because the scapegoat ceremony is found in Revelation chapter 20. So all of the doctrines of the Bible are found in the sanctuary. What a magnificent lesson God taught through the Hebrew sanctuary. Thank you.